Uh, and th without, uh, yes, any further delay, uh, I'll welcome Melissa Omanyabos, Diana Gravelacy, and KP Yelkala. How's everybody doing? Good. Hanging in there? I know. Um, so, thanks for the opportunity to share with you a bit about what we're up to with Access Mobile. Um, <laughs> So Access Mobile is a venture that I started late in 2010. And just to give you some context, I'm a guy who has always been interested in global health. I trained in public health, worked for numerous NGOs, founded an NGO, um, lived in lots of places, and really came to find that I wasn't fully satisfied with how I saw a lot of global health initiatives being implemented attempting to get the scale on the ground, right? So, I mean, you could say I'm an entrepreneur, maybe even a social entrepreneur. Basically, I'm, I'm all about experimentation. So, um, I just kind of threw a lot of my conceptions about the private sector aside and said, you know, what if I could actually create a business, so a for-profit venture, that would have social impact, that would be economically sustainable, and that would be able to tackle social um, and technology issues in a low-income environment, right? And that's the experiment that we're currently undergoing with Access Mobile. Um, to give you some context, um, we'll kind of talk about e-health and m-health more generally speaking, um, just to give you some background on what's going on in the field. Um, I'll try to kind of zip through these slides so that we can have a discussion and I can answer any questions you may have. I'll talk a bit about what we're doing with Access Mobile and Diana and Alyssa will also share some of their experiences helping me build this venture. Um, and then we'll talk specifically about some of the work that we've launched in Uganda. Um, how many of you have had an experience kind of dabbling in mobile health or mobile technology in kind of developing country environments? Have any of you done any projects in that area? Are familiar with it? Okay, cool. So um, if I get into technical jargon or things that maybe aren't making sense, just knock me over the head, because sometimes we do that in technology, and we, we get into the technical jargon of smiling, because I do this a lot. Um, so um, just, let, just let me know if there's something I'm talking about that you might not be familiar with. <coughs> so just talking about e-health, right? So you know, the World Health Organization basically describes e-health as the application of internet technology or other related technologies in healthcare, right? Um, the types of applications range from uh, disease surveillance, health information management, telemedicine, training. There are lots of things you could do with technology and health, right? Technology is just an enabler. Um, so I tell people a lot of times what happens for those of us that have come from a development background is we get focused on one technology we've seen that does a specific thing, right? I mean, honestly, technology can do anything you want it to do. It's just about putting money to it. Like if you, if you are familiar with some of the things that are going on in technology in our day-to-day -day lives, you might be shocked to know the level of sophistication that goes on behind technology. So really the question isn't, you know, what can this certain technology do for me, but rather it's about stepping back and saying, okay, we have all these different problems we're trying to tackle in healthcare. What is the role of technology in specifically tackling those different challenges, right? And then you take that idea and then you think about context. You say, okay, we've got lots of different things we can do that can have an impact in health. Um, we have some specific areas where we think we can use technology in a meaningful way. And then we have to think about context, right? Um, Uganda is very different than Denver, right? Actually, you know, a lot of the technologies that we're designing we're also applying here in Colorado. So technology can also be adapted and scaled in lots of different ways. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we design something in an African context and it can't be applied in other places, right? Um, so obviously lots of groups can benefit, it's like anyone that's in the healthcare ecosystem, right? So whether it's government, nonprofit organizations, private health clinics, um, hospitals, it doesn't matter who, but anyone that's in that health ecosystem will benefit from technology. So we've been hearing a lot about mHealth, right? So mHealth is just about the utilization of mobile devices and mobile technology um, in delivering and uh, kind of managing medical and public health services, right? So a lot of times when we talk about mHealth, we're talking about things like patient monitoring compliance, disease prevention, public wellness, remote data access, things of that nature. 
Telemedicine is uh, another area where we've kind of seen a convergence with mobile health. So telemedicine is just utilizing telecommunications in the actual delivery of healthcare services. So and you guys might be familiar with some of the technologies that are rolling out where, um, for example, someone that's in a rural area that has connectivity can take a picture of something um, and basically send that picture to a doctor that's in another place that can look at it, give them advice on what they might be dealing with, and kind of enable that interaction, right? That's kind of like a way that mobile and telemedicine are converging. Um, so when we think about mHealth in a low-income environment, so there's a number of other trends that we have to think about as to why we're even having this discussion. So the first is that phones are everywhere. And it's, it's not an intuitive thing if you, if you haven't really spent a lot of time in these environments. You might not think that literally in every corner of a lot of these countries that are defined as low-income or middle-income, um, people have phones. Not only do they have what we might call a feature phone or low-end phones, but they also have increasingly smartphones, which is another thing that we may not intuitively think is happening, right? Um, at the same time, the cost of those phones is going down. Network coverage, right? Phone is useless without having network connectivity. So just to give you an example, in a place like Uganda, about 98% of the country has network coverage. Doesn't matter where you are, you will get a cell phone signal, right? So that is part of what's driving these trends and driving increased connectivity in those countries. That's very common in most countries in Africa, Latin America, Middle East, doesn't matter. Network coverage has expanded dramatically in the last five years, right? So that means people have devices, they work regularly, right? Um, they're dropping in price. They increasingly have smartphones and low-end phones, right? And so then people are becoming more conversant with how to use a phone. So a lot of times, you know, we get, I hear people say, well, you know, do people actually know how to use a phone? Like, you know, you're in these environments, people are poor or whatever. Like, honestly, I mean, people can make a call. If they don't know how to send a text message, they can find someone that will send a text message. Like, the phone is kind of like their life one, right? Because the ability to connect and communicate is really important. So a lot of people actually are very familiar with how to use the basic functions of a phone. And I can't go into it today, but we actually did, Diana implemented this for us. We did um, a survey with community health volunteers for BRAC. Are some of you guys familiar with BRAC? So we worked with BRAC in Uganda and we took 24 community health volunteers. And we ran a survey about their knowledge of how to use mobile devices and how mobile devices played in their work. And the short story is that, maybe we talk about that another time, but the short story is everyone is comfortable with the phones, everyone used the phone in their day-to-day -day work, outreaching to communities and individuals for their health care. And in the rare case that maybe one or two of the women who were generally older weren't comfortable with the phones, they had like a daughter or a family member that did it for them, right? Um, so generally speaking, people are familiar with devices. So this graph here shows mobile subscriptions per 100 inhabitants over time, right? Going up to 2011. So it's a pretty staggering slide. So if you look at this, right, you see that all countries, all regions of the world have had exponential increase in devices. So this is the world trend line, right? If you look at Latin America, actually, there are people actually have more than one phone, right? That's what this 107 means. Right? Sub-Saharan Africa is a bit of a steadier growth curve, right? And India obviously is peaking um, in terms of saturation of mobile devices. Can you, I just wonder, because I know in Uganda in particular, a lot of people have multiple um, SIM cards and multiple phones, and they have a lot of different phone numbers. Um, good point. How do, you, how do you address that? So the market's actually addressing that. That's a really good point. Thanks for bringing that up. So. Does anyone know why people would carry multiple SIM cards? Can they get good deals on, yeah, I think that was what I Exactly. Calling people on the same network is cheaper. So to an analogy here is, when you're in a place like Uganda, calling, if you have AT&T, calling someone that also has AT&T is cheaper than 
calling someone that has Verizon if you have AT&T. So what happens is because the cost of getting a SIM card is free, people will actually get SIM cards with multiple carriers so that they can call people in the same network and reduce their costs, right? So how does the market address that? Well, the markets address that from the device side. They're increasingly devices that are dual SIM, right? So, and actually the device that we use in our projects is also dual SIM, so people will slot in both of, most people have two SIM cards, so they'll slot in both SIM cards in the same device, so they don't have to be swapping them out, right? But that's a great point. Um, this is just to show us that phones are everywhere, right? And the trend is global. So, the fact of the matter is, when we think about mobile, it's not even just about health. Mobile is driving all types of things in these economic environments, right? Um, and it's going to continue for several years. Any of you guys familiar with kind of open source versus proprietary technology? So open source is um, it's a way of kind of thinking about technology as being open. Um, and so to the extent that the code that is used to build the software is open, it means any person can access it, can adapt it, can build on it. Um, to make improvements, right? Are you guys familiar with the web browser that's open source that we use a lot of its processes? Chrome. Chrome? Firefox. Chrome and Firefox, right? They're both open source platforms. So, um, proprietary, right? So, proprietary is basically um, they're technologies that are designed by private companies um, that are not open. So, code or whatever has been developed in that software, not open to the public, it's the intellectual property of the business. What do you guys think some of the differences or some of the trade-offs are between these two models? You guys have any thoughts? Open source versus proprietary? Proprietary, there's more support sometimes um, from like the who created the product, um, and it's typically more stable. Um, right. In some cases, but open source, it gives you a lot of leeway to be free and for people to experiment with it, but sometimes it's a little more buggy and, and um, difficult to get support on. Spot on. I don't need to say anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, um, and so what happens here is a lot of development projects are, are actually open source, right? <clears throat> because in a lot of these contexts, organizations are limited in their resources or the end users don't have a lot of money to pay for technology, so there's been a big push towards open source. And actually, this isn't, just in the, this isn't just in the developing country environment, but it's a global kind of culture around technology. Um, proprietary technologies are, I would say, important, and actually access mobile technologies are proprietary because um, when you build a proprietary technology, usually the quality is a little bit better. Um, there's incentive for the company to iterate on the product, to improve it, um, to expand upon it, right? But this is still probably a little bit of a sensitive issue in the world of development because generally it's a, it's a world driven by nonprofit organizations that tend to be skeptical about private companies. So, sorry, we oh, no worries. <laughs> Well, that gives us a, a backdrop kind of on mobile. Are there any other questions before we dive into what Access Mobile does, just in terms of the mobile landscape and health? So, Access Mobile. So we're a global mobile technology social enterprise. We're a business registered here in Denver. We have offices here in Denver and, and uh, Uganda. Um, so we design basically mobile technologies for data capture and analytics. Um, as well as some apps that we're experimenting with. And really our goal is, whether you're a private organization or a large nonprofit, um, to help you interact, communicate, retrieve, and analyze information more efficiently through mobile, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's been an increasing trend in the space. So in terms of how we make money, we charge licensing and service fees for our solutions, right? So when we engage with an organization, um, they may say, hey, you know, we, we can we like your solution, we think it can benefit us, we see the value, it's gonna make data collection cheaper for us, so on and so forth. And so oftentimes what'll happen is on the services side, it's basically like consulting. So we look at their data needs, we think about how to customize our solution to their needs. And the licensing of the ongoing fees, which they pay in different ways, yearly or per user, that helps us maintain and improve the technology. That's very common, this is how most technology companies make money. 
and our vision. Our, our vision is basically a world in which any organization, particularly large social organizations, have top-notch technology. So not to say that there aren't private companies that would love to use our technologies, but given our triple bottom line, we're really interested in looking at large NGOs or other large enterprises with social impact and making sure that there's someone out there that can offer them technology, right? Those type of groups can't afford to work with like Microsoft or SAP or other big companies like that. Um, and so our, our goal is kind of to fill that void as there's this increasing trend in mobile. So there are kind of three products that we've rolled out that I'll describe, AM Health, AM Supply, and AM Communicator. Um, AM Health is a customizable mobile solution to assist in health data capture. So let me just give you a story, and actually this is a story of our project in Uganda. So the group that we're dealing with in Uganda, they, they manage or oversee 100 different private clinics across Uganda, right? Urban, peri-urban rural. And of those 100 clinics, Okay, a few of them have internet, so maybe like 10 to 15, right? So when it comes to getting information from those clinics, fine, they do their data management in Excel, they email the files, they discuss it, they're done, right? The rest of those clinics have no access to internet. A lot of them don't have computers, right? Most of them are paper-based. So you can imagine what it takes to try to get information from that type of clinic, right? The way they were doing it before they started working with us is basically every quarter there's a staff member who had like the worst job I could imagine, which was to drive to all 78 clinics that were unconnected, collect the paper documents, photocopy them, type it, analyze it, then send it to their reporters. So you can imagine the amount of time and money and headache in doing that, right? So we basically showed up and were like, you don't need to do any of that. Right? It was a very easy sell. And this is one of the things about being a business. Like, if you're a business and you want to offer someone a solution, you solve a problem. And, and I walk in and I just say, look, if I don't solve your problem or if you think my solution is too expensive, don't work with me. Fine. Right? That's a tough thing to do, you know, and it's not, it's not the way that NGOs are trained to think. Right? Like, I need to be solving your problem. I need to be doing it well. Right? And so we went in and I said, look, what if I could just take all that data you collect and translate it into a form on a mobile device? We can distribute those devices to the data managers at each clinic, and when they enter that information into the phone, it automatically logs in online. They're like, you can do that? It's like, yeah, we can do that. Okay, that's the project, right? Um, and not only are we tracking health data, so that's the health element of the solution, right? Um, we're tracking supply chain data. <laughs> So one of the big things that you guys might be familiar with in these environments is the issue of stockouts, right? It's a big issue in global health. Sites are always stocking out of drugs. So why do sites stock out of drugs? You guys want to throw out some reasons? Incorrect forecasting. Okay, incorrect forecasting. Sorry? Some sort of outbreak on that specific. Right, an outbreak, which would relate to forecasting as well, because then you don't know yeah, and in, increase like usage of the facility. Right, increase usage of the facility. Issues in the supply chain. Or? Issues in the supply chain. Supply chain just breaks down. No drugs in the country. No drugs in the country. No, no, no. It's being difficult. No, that, that's actually no, that's actually a big issue in Uganda. Uganda is one of the countries that had no ARVs. The U.S. government had to step in and, and fill the void because the government stocked out of all their national stores. So that is valid. <laughs> um, other thoughts? Um, yeah, one time like, they changed the guidelines for the CD4 count, and then like, my clinic heard the wrong thing. And so they started like, giving people ARVs at a guideline that they weren't supposed to, but right. at an earlier guideline, and so that we stocked up. Right, so misinformation. <laughs> so you guys have nailed a lot of the issues in supply chains. Supply yeah. chains are really complex and hard. But what's the fundamental <laughs> underlying issue? about no access to data. We don't know, right? So if you're going to a private clinic out in the middle of Uganda, you're trying to figure out how much, how many malaria bed nets do they need? How much of first line ARV regimens do they need? How much quartum do they need? You don't have any data to know what the consumption levels or demand is. You don't have any data about the inventory at the clinic, right? 
how can you make any choices? So basically, the way people make decisions is like this. <laughs> I think I need 100 boxes of malaria drugs this month. Why? Eh. Last month, we did 80. Eh, it's getting close to the rainy season, so I'm bumping up a little bit. This is actually how supply chains work. This is why we have stockouts. It's about data, right? So on the stockout issue, and we see this also as an area of significant social impact, we said, what if we could track all your ARV logistics data through the device? And so that's what we did. So we built these forms that basically track all this different information on ARVs. There are three indicators that we're tracking on every drug. Consumption levels, balance, and stockout days. Right? One of the issues on stockouts is that oftentimes you don't know what drug is actually being stocked out in the clinic. So the way it usually works is you get a call, you're like a group that's supporting the clinics, you get a call and the site's like, hey, you know, we're out of this first line regimen for ARVs. They're like, okay, how much more inventory do you have? Well, actually, I ran out of drugs last week. You're like, what? What do you mean you ran out of drugs last week? They're like, yeah, sorry, like we've been having a lot of patient flow, we ran out of drugs, it's been crazy, people have been angry, haven't had any time to call you, and now we're calling you, telling you we're a week behind, there's no drugs, we have patients coming in, now you know all the problems that go with this, you have issues of adherence, like loss to follow up, all this stuff, right? Um, so basically what we're trying to do is put the groups that manage the supply chain in the driver's seat with data, right? So if you're tracking consumption, you understand demand. Right? for every drug. So you understand at any given time what's going on with your demand pattern. Now as you start to aggregate that data set over time, it becomes very powerful. So looking at consumption at any point in time, helpful, but not really useful. Looking at consumption over a year becomes really powerful. Looking at consumption over a year for every ARV regimen, even more powerful. Okay, fine. Inventory. Inventory tells us about how to predict when a stockout is going to happen, right? That's our balanced indicator. So our balanced indicator tells us what's in the inventory at any given time, right? Stockout days. So oftentimes with stockouts, again, this call, right? You got this call, it's just like I ran out of drugs a week ago. They didn't tell you what drugs they ran out of. They didn't give you any details. It's just like I'm out of drugs. You're like, well, what drugs? Like, what do you need? They're like, oh, well, okay, let me go and go into my inventory and run some counts, right? So stockout days for specific drugs becomes very powerful data because now we have specificity, right? We can also look at those trends. Um, so this is what AM Supply is designed to do. Now, AM Supply can work for any supply chain issue. It doesn't matter what the commodity is. I just gave you a health example, right? ARP logistics is some of the most hardcore supply chain challenges you can imagine. I mean, it's something people have been trying to crack since we started scaling up ART in different countries. Um, the other piece of this, which we'll get to, is we run data analytics. So not only is this data being captured through the device, but when the central administrator logs in, they see it in a meaningful way. So we actually run consumption trend data. Um, we're we're going to start running stockout algorithms. So basically, when, when an administrator, administrator logs into our website, they'll be able to see which sites are at risk of stockout over which period of time. So now, instead of waiting to get that call a week after a site stocked out of drugs, you'll know going in a month before, two weeks before, that that site is going low on inventory and for what specific drugs. Right? So this becomes very powerful in lots of different contexts. Um, so that's AM Supply. To round things off, rolled out any communicator. And this kind of came out of what clients were asking us for. And the simple story of AM Communicator is just an SMS-based platform that allows you to be able to push and pull information through SMS. So it doesn't matter what type of phone anyone has, as long as they have the ability to receive and send a text message, you can engage them, right? Um, so you can imagine that that type of solution can be used to remind sites to enter data. It could be used to send weekly messages to pregnant moms about um, their maternal child health needs. I mean, it could be used for lots of things. But AM Communicator, we found we needed to round off our offering because so many of the solutions that are out there and so much of the push around the lowest common denominator technology is through SMS. And so that's what we achieved through, through that solution. Other products we're playing with, so AM Survey. So 
the concept here is that AM Server would just be a standard surveying platform through mobile. So if you're a group that's running household surveys in a community, doing anything where you need to capture data on the move, AM Survey would be the solution that would allow you to do that through mobile. And then again, you build the data analytics for you as well, so you can kind of see that information in real time in a meaningful way. Um, we're going to do that also as an Android app, um, you know, because Android phones are increasing in their ubiquity all over the world, so we realize we have to be doing that as well. Um, AM outreach. So we've been also thinking about this idea of community outreach workers. So it doesn't matter where they are. Actually, it's something we're thinking about here in the U.S. Going to a large national health group. But if you're an outreach worker that's going door to door doing anything, obviously mobile, particularly tablet-based solutions, can be really powerful for you in terms of entering data, capturing information, uh, connecting with other actors in your social service ecosystem. Here's some of the other areas we're going. Any questions on the uh, technology? Can you do this in any language? Yeah, yeah, we can do this in any language. So um, in Uganda, what we're doing is in English. Um, but we've actually, with a couple projects that are rolling out, they'll be done in local languages. Yeah, so that can be done. How, how able are you guys to be quick in responding to um, like issues with the system or issues with your technology? Ah. You want to take that, Diana? Sure. That was going to come up a little later, uh, too. Okay. Question. Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. Um, since our team is in Uganda, we have um, some of the people who work on our, our mobile development are in India, um, which actually puts the time zone in our favor. So our tech team, if an issue ever needs to be forwarded to them, um, are pretty much on it. They're pretty much in exactly the same time zone. But another advantage of having us as well um, in Denver means that we can kind of work 24 hours a day on things if they really need to get fixed quickly. Um, and our Uganda team is, I would say, very responsive um, to issues that arise in, in terms of, you know, any site can, can actually get in touch with them. Um, it's a, we have a closed user group for the phones, so it's free for them to call. Um, the, the tech support and to have an answer to their question relatively, relatively quickly. But I would say that most of the time, the issues that come up are things that are even in team can handle. Yeah, so I mean, and that's another thing about how we do business, which is when you're a tech company, it's all about the user, right? If your user is not happy, you're not going anywhere. So we're pretty, I mean, I'm really obsessed with users. So, like, <laughs> actually, we have a user log where, like, my team tracks every encounter with every site at any time. So anytime a site calls, it's logged. Anytime a site has an issue, it's logged. Anytime we contact a site, it's logged. Anytime someone's pissed off, it's logged. Right? And I read it. I read all of it in a lot of detail. Because honestly, that is how you assess your technology. Like if, if your technology isn't able to meet your users' needs in a way that doesn't give them headaches, you're not doing your job. So you, you need that data, but you have to get it, right? And by being obsessed with the user, that's how you can iterate on the product to make it relevant. Um, and so we spend a lot of time um, focused on the users, visiting the sites, asking them about the technology, um, taking their feedback. So one thing that's really important is you know, and we've all had these experiences too when we've had to call someone about our technology breaking down. It's, if someone calls you with a problem, they want to know that you're at least working on it, at least you heard them, at least you, you care that they call. And we know that customer service, I mean, we've all had a bad and a good customer service experience. We know how those different experiences shape how we perceive a company, right? So because we're a new business in Uganda, and honestly, because my take is in Africa and other places, people are used to having shoddy technology. Right? They're actually used to things not working, things breaking. So like I set the bar so high that like inherently I'm killing all the other companies. Because like I treat them like any other person. You should have the best technology. Because you're in Uganda doesn't mean I'm gonna give you half-baked technology. And then here in Denver, because the standards may be a little higher, I'm gonna give them better technology. Everyone gets the same good technology. That responds really well with users. You get brand loyalty, all of a sudden, those users are a little bit more forgiving if something breaks. Like, you know what, oh, okay, you know, because we're on version 1.0. It's like, it's inherent. Version 1.0 of a technology, it breaks, it's buggy, you're, you're iterating on it. But when you build that type of relationship with the user and they know that you're focused on what they need, they're more forgiving, right? They're more loyal, they're gonna stick with you. So that's another element, again, of how when you're a business as opposed to an NGO, how you think differently about how you engage users, how you think about um, their needs. Well, and also AM Communicator lets us 
Like if there's an issue that's coming up across several sites and we need to inform the, all the sites using the phones that this is going on and that we're aware of it, then we're able to use the technology as well to get a message out to them quickly. So they're, not only are we responding to their needs, we can also preempt things that come Yeah, up. exactly. So we use AM Communicator ourselves. So yeah, we use it in engaging all those sites for exactly the reasons Diana mentioned. So in Uganda, I talked about HIPS, right? So HIPS is a US government initiative that's run by Cargill um, out of Arlington. And uh, I talked to you a little bit about the initiative, but what they're doing is they're working with Ugandan businesses all over the country of all sizes. I mean, really large national businesses to smaller private um, entities um, around ensuring that those private clinics offer good services to their employees, but also extend their reach in the community. So for us, it's kind of had a nice synergy because we're working with other private sector actors, right? So they kind of share a similar ethos to what we do. Um, and so as I mentioned, we rolled out these 70 clinics. So to give you a sense of how crazy this was, like we signed the contract for this deal last November, so November of 2011, and we rolled out. By the way, the tech wasn't built in November of 2011. We built it and rolled it out on the first sites in January. And we actually just rolled out we finished the rollout this week on Monday for the next 32 sites. So it's live in 70 clinics. We've been getting really good feedback. Um, the system's been used, so we track the use of the system on a regular basis, and the uptake rates have been incredible. I mean, and I think what I think what it is is we basically just tried to mimic what they were already doing on the phone. We didn't try to add new things that were unfamiliar to them. So what I can tell you is like, you know, these groups are doing weekly or monthly reporting and in any given month, I mean, even in the first month we rolled this out, I think we had, it was like 60% uptake in the first couple days of that reporting period for the month of people entering the data. We didn't have to call them, we didn't have to do anything. I mean, those type of up, uptake rates are like unheard of with the usual kind of NGO model in mobile, right? And, and I expect that in the next few months, we're gonna to get to a very high, maybe over 80% uptake rate on people reporting through this system regularly on a monthly and weekly basis. Um, <coughs> and so in terms of the goals, you have two kind of key goals we're trying to address. So the efficiency of the data collection process, which I talked about earlier, and then reducing stock out. So those are the metrics that we're evaluating. So we baseline all the users, so we're evaluating it really rigorously, which has a benefit both to HIPS and to us because HIPS wants to show this technology is working and it's cost effective for them, and we also want to show that it's benefiting our client as we want to go out and sell this to other customers, right? Um, so we baseline all the sites. We're going to do a midterm evaluation. We also have all this other user data, which isn't necessarily evaluation data, but still gives us a lot of insight into the technology. Um, and I, I expect that it's going to be a really interesting over the next couple months. So how does system work? So this remote user is the person at the clinic, right? So the person at the clinic has a mobile device that was deployed, right? And so in the back end, the way we set up this system is it actually moves the data through SMS. So while you have these forms on the phone and you're entering the numerical data or whatever um, through the device, it's actually SMS in the background that's moving it through our GSM modem eventually to our servers, right? And it's from our servers that then the data populates online and it's accessible to whoever has the authority to look at the information. Um, why might we be using SMS in the back end for this system? Any thoughts? Standard global. Sorry? It's, it's the global standard, you can use it anywhere. Right, it's the global standard, it can be used anywhere. So while data, so when I say data, I'm talking about 3G or GPRS, it's available in cities or other urban hubs. Um, it's not as ubiquitous yet. Data services, which are driving smartphone and Android, particularly Android use and apps in the environment, um, it's growing and over time we're gonna see more and more 3G services like throughout Uganda, whether you're in like a rural area or urban area. We're not there yet. So what would happen if I built this system on 3G, what would happen is in my rural sites, when they wanted to send information, they wouldn't be able to send it, right? Um, now there are some groups that have to use a system called caching, which is basically a system that allows you to save a web form if, if your system's built off of 3G. And then when you get access to a signal, then it moves the data then. So there are some technologies that do that. 
we wanted to go for real time. And so using SMS, I thought, was the best approach. And I think so far, we found it's also cost effective. So right now, actually, out of all the 70 sites, we only had, because we used Airtel, which is one of the major carriers in Uganda, we only had one site that did not have Airtel coverage in their, in their region. And all we did, but they did have another coverage, so we just basically switched the system to the other network, right? And it was a plantation, yeah, so it's like out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but that was the only site, so again, about connectivity, all of our sites are connected no matter where, and the ability of the system to move data in real time. Data security, big issue, right? So there are two forms where we're moving patient data in the system, right? Um, and when we're doing that, obviously patient confidentiality is key. So, um, and a lot of these are HIV infected patients. So one thing that happens is no patient name is ever entered into the system, right? Only patient ID, right? Other, other indicators such as gender, date of birth, or HIV status, we encrypt. Even though any of those indicators independently doesn't really tell you much, it gives our client more comfort, right? That that data is encrypted, so it's an added layer of security. Um, users have to register into the system. So when they first use <coughs> a mobile device, and Diana will talk maybe a little bit about this more um, in terms of her work on the ground, um, you have to register into the system, and then each user actually has a unique login and password, including a password for the forms on the phone. So if their phone was stolen or something, or if they lost it, someone else couldn't like go in and enter data. Now, I don't know who would want to do that, but whatever. Like, you know, no one can go in and access that information through the device. Um, and then obviously on the online login, that's also um, password protected with unique um, user of login. Right? So this is an example of a form, so it's really straightforward, right? So you just go through and you enter all this information really quickly. If it's not complete, you can just save the information on the device. When you're ready, you can send it. Once you send it, you're done. It's in the system, it's live online. This is the online dashboard that clinics see, right? So one of the other things that we did in this project is so our central administrator that manages the 100 clinics, they obviously want to see this data, do their analysis, be more efficient in how they're tracking indicators. But the thing that we realized really quickly is, look, if you're a clinic entering all this data, you want access to it too, right? And you should, it's your data. So we actually built, this isn't the dashboard that HIP sees, but this is a dashboard that any independent clinic sees. So this is our version 1.0. So we just started with some really basic hypotheses. One, they should know whether they're on track or not for any given form, right? So green means they've submitted it, they're doing well, red means they need to get on task, right? Um, this tells them what to expect in terms of their next set of forms, what they do. And this is where they can export the data. So this is where they just click their time period, the forms or all the forms, all time periods, and they can get their information electronically. So now we've kind of added an extra benefit to these clinics, right? Um, Any, any questions on that? UHMG, this is another group we're working with. Um, we're getting ready to roll out some really fun projects with them. So the Uganda Health Marketing Group is basically like the local equivalent of PSI, Popul Population Services International in Uganda. They're a very large, kind of wide-reaching social marketing for health organizations. So they manage something called the Good Life Clinics Campaign in which they support 250 different good light clinics throughout the country. Um, they also manage their own supply chain on sexual and reproductive health products. So you can kind of get the picture of how a lot of the things that I was talking about, about health data management through these 250 clinics, about supply chain, kind of fit very nicely with this organization. Um, we have a partnership with them basically to be their go-to mobile service provider. And again, like that's how I'm positioning this organization. So. I just went to UHMG and, and I said, look, like instead of you having to go and shop around for like all these different groups that have one-off technologies, what if you had one group you could go to that could really help provide your tech needs holistically when it comes to mobile, right? That's how we framed our work together. Um, so one of the things that we're looking to potentially roll out, which would be really fun, is a, another 150 health clinics basically using a similar model to what we designed for HIPS. Right? They track different types of indicators. 
Um, and what's really interesting about this, if you think about this from a strategy perspective, is that UHMG actually aligns with the ministry in terms of tracking their health indicators. So you can imagine that if I've got 150 Good Life clinics using our mobile platform, in essence, what I've designed, so that's 150 with UHMG, it's 70 with HIPS, so that's 220 clinics in one country using one mobile health information platform. That's my, that's my end goal with this stuff. That is unheard of. So I'll tell you, there's no one in any country in Africa that can claim they, they're doing 220 clinics on one mobile platform. That is what NGO thinking doesn't allow us to do. So let me tell you another thing. The 70 clinics that we did was not a pilot. So you know, the natural inclination, I struggle with this, like, because if I wear my NGO hat, I'm like, oh, okay, 70 clinics, that's the total need. I need a pilot 20, I'll do it for a year, then I'll do another 20, then I'll do another 20, and then finally in four years I hit 70. We just did all 70 in months, three months. It's fine, the system's working, it's challenging, I'm not gonna say it wasn't hard, but it's live. To me, this is, when we talk about enterprise thinking development, this is what enterprise thinking does. It pushes you out of the comfort zone. If we do this 150 clinics, it's not a pilot. We're just gonna roll out all 150, probably over like four months, right? That is, it's uncomfortable, trust me, it's hard. You guys know these environments. Doing 150 clinics is not, it's not a light task. I mean, we'll share some of the headaches. You know, I mean, this stuff keeps you up all night, right? Um, but to me, if we think about pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone in global health, this is what enterprise thinking is about. When we talk about scale up, this is what it's about. It's getting out of the box and saying, you know what, I'm not going to wait for five years to do 150 clinics. We're just going to do it. The need is there now. I have a solution that's proven that can have impact, can save time, can save money, reduce stockouts or improve health outcomes for people. I'm not going to wait five years to do it. I'm just going to do it, right? That's enterprise thinking. That's our orientation. And it's uncomfortable, so it's not for everybody. It's also uncharted. So we're experimenting. I don't know the answer. We're actually, the story is unfolding now as we speak, right? Other things we're doing. Um, so we're excited about this. We're rolling this out in the next month or so. So UHMG at Uganda Health Marketing Group came to us and basically said, you know, in their network of clinics, they have lots of pregnant moms. They realize they should be using SMS to try to more effectively communicate with those pregnant moms about their needs. A lot of the stuff that we'd be familiar with that lots of different groups are doing. So they approached us and asked us if we can help them do that. What we're rolling out is, I kind of wanted to push the thinking on this because I told them in all honesty, Doing text messages to pregnant moms is not innovative. Everyone's doing it. People have been doing it for a long time. So like, let's think about how we might push the box on that idea. It's important, though. So I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't do it. And not everything has to be innovative. Like sometimes if something's proven and it works and it's good, you should just do it, all right? And that's what we're going to do with these SMS reminders for pregnant women. But a couple of areas where we want to push the boundaries a bit. One is around what happens if Let's say you send a text message to a pregnant mom saying, if you're having these symptoms, inform a medical official, right? So what if one of those women is having those symptoms? What should happen next? Well, obviously they should be connected with a medical official. Now given that UHMG has this network of 250 clinics, I said, well, what if we can actually build a system through mobile that would actually connect that pregnant mom that's having those symptoms to a clinic, right? kind of automated process to connect them to the right clinic individual to have a discussion. Connecting is on the phone? On the phone, and it could be through SMS, it could be a kind of an automated system that um, takes a text message and then, you know, based on how they respond, then sends them a number or then sends a number to the clinic so that the clinic then contacts the person so there's no cost to them. We haven't fully baked the model, but that's another era that we're going to play around with that we think will be really interesting and hopefully we can prove that that actually drives some hard outcomes, right, for, for pregnant moms. I and mean, also in the neonatal stage. Third area, we're going to roll out an Android app. So the fact is, SMS is the lowest common denominator, but in all these countries in Africa, more and more people have smartphones. Obviously, people that have smartphones tend to be um, of maybe a higher socioeconomic status, right? Doesn't mean that we shouldn't have apps for those people as well in these environments. 
So the third prong is we're actually we're actually contributing this to the project. So we're not paying for that. We're actually going to push out what we think is the first Ugandan kind of first Uganda pregnancy app for women um, there. So it's specific, like tailored to the local environment, local languages, deals with local issues in pregnancy. There are tons of pregnancy apps all over the world, particularly in Western markets. So our thought is, why not have one that's for Ugandan women? That's the third prong there. So this is something we're getting ready to roll out that we're pretty excited about. Um, Diana and Alyssa, your turn. <laughs> so I think Diana's going to share a bit about her experiences with the rollout. She was the one that was on the ground when we went through those first pains, and Alyssa's been helping actually manage all of this, which is also its own challenge. Um, so I was there in the summer, initially, when we started going through the process of kind of assessing what we could do in Uganda. Um, and then I, say I talked about that, I don't know if maybe was at that talk, but I talked about it earlier. Um, and then we went through, as Katie said, it was really, really quick, November to January, developed everything. <clears throat> I was there for the rollout in January. So basically went through with our team, tested the tech every day, all day, for three days straight. Um, <laughs> like sitting in a hotel room, just us, like going through with the phones. Um, and then we, we did deployment and we did training with the users. So basically, um, it, was, it was a really interesting experience. And obviously, you know, you see people who are like early uptake kind of situation with a new innovation. And then you see people who see the value and maybe require a little bit more like one-on-one -on -one effort. But there were very, very few people, I think only two across the three trainings, um, of 38 users that actually had kind of had trouble or like didn't really see see the value. And when we were baselining all this information, one comment that we received over and over and over again was how time consuming it was for these clinics to keep track of their own information. Because um, I mean, I know you talked about how the headquarters kind of manages that information, but in the clinic setting, like you have a patient come in and you fill out a ledger for that individual patient. And then at the end of the week or the month, like you aggregate all of that information into another ledger. And then when you're going through to do your reporting, you aggregate all of that information that you previously aggregated into a third ledger that, that you then send or someone comes and gets. And it's, it's also a time consuming model for them. So it was exciting to be there and exciting to see that on the ground. Um, like Katie said, there are some headaches that come with a national scale rollout. Um, there are just some things that you can't necessarily foresee until you've actually rolled the technology out. So as much of the testing that we, we went through, there were still issues that the clinics experienced when they were actually entering their own data. So then they were coming back to us and saying like, okay, when I try to do this, like this happens, and what am I supposed to do? So then, you know, you do as much preemptive stuff as you can, and then past that you do, you do triage. And we were lucky to not run into major issues um, and the weeks after our, our first rollout. So, I don't know if you want to well, add anything to that? Yeah. If, does anyone have questions for me about okay. so then Melissa can ask some questions? <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll keep this short since I know some people have class at two, including myself. <laughs> we want to have time for questions. Um, but basically, I mean, my role is managing the operations of the business. So it's very challenging in you know having an international business managing operations, and especially just kind of from a team standpoint. I think both Kiki and Diana mentioned that we have people kind of all over the world. I mean, we have our U.S. team here. We have our team in Uganda. We also have our development team in India, and we even have um, another team member in Tanzania. So kind of trying to like keep that team cohesion. Everyone's on different time zones, and we're all kind of working on different things from a business standpoint is very challenging and um, difficult. But basically, kind of the model we've worked with is um, we've all tried to like have times where we've, no one's really come here, but both Kipi and Diana have been to Uganda, and I'm planning on going there um, later this year. And we've just tried to like keep consistent conversations going with people. Um, we've found that like having a couple team calls a week as well as, I mean, Skype is huge, as annoying as it is to use with three different countries. Um, we use Skype a lot. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I don't really want to bore you with all the operational things, because I know it's not something that everyone's excited about. But just some challenging things that we've also found is um, being a business versus an NGO, kind of working in um, Uganda or just anywhere in general is a lot different. 
um, there's a lot of legal stuff that you have to consider um, thinking about. I, I don't know, one challenge I've had is currency exchange. Yeah, I thought you were talking about that. Um, we have four employees in Uganda, and um, I mean, they, they're all locals, they're all Ugandans, so they have their Ugandan bank accounts, and it's literally like a nightmare because the Ugandan shilling is very variable right now. I mean, I think a few months ago it was like 2700 to the dollar and now it's 2200 and it's always changing. So trying to like pay people's salaries and like predict the, the currency exchange is really difficult. And one thing that would make that less difficult is actually being like a registered Ugandan organization on the ground. But from being a business, it's not as easy as it sounds. And I don't know, that's just one challenge I've found and it's difficult to deal with. So is your pay scale like you pay them on the US thing and you earn it every month or are you? Well, so basically what we've done to try and resolve the situation, because you know, you have to think about it, you want your employees to be paid their salary, but at the same time from a business perspective, you also have to be aware that like you can't really take on all the risk, you know. I mean if you're paying someone five million shillings, which is maybe like two thousand dollars. Um, and the currency exchange, you know, is, goes down to 1800 and you put that price at 2700 I mean, that's a huge expense for the business. So what we've kind of done to try and, like, mediate that risk is we've, we have a range of, like, the currency exchange we're willing to pay. So let's say someone gets paid at, gets paid 5 million shillings and we put that rate at 2500 shillings per dollar and the rate's 2200 We'll pay that, we'll bump it up to like try and match that five million shilling. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? But then if it were to go below like 2,200, we would have to reevaluate the situation. And vice versa, if it were to go above like 2,700, we would reevaluate, so. Yeah, Alyssa's done a great job with it. It's, it's, this is tough stuff, and I mean, she was, <laughs> she was the one handling these battles. I mean, staff members would get frustrated, like, look, I'm not, my pay dropped because of the exchange rate. Um, and as, I, as she mentioned, we're not registered locally yet for various reasons. Legally doing that as a business is not a straightforward thing. You have, to, you have to think it through. There's lots of legal lawyers involved, lots of stuff. So it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and so, yeah, she was taking a lot of heat from staff over their pay. Um, but, you know, we had to meet in the middle. But the exchange rate risks, these are just, I just wanted to share, like, some of these nuts and bolts things that happen, too. Like, it's not technology and all that's cool. But it's like there's just a lot of operational challenges you also face. Um, she's been doing a great job, as is Diana. So. At the end user level, um, were they willing to give up immediately? In other words, take all the risk on this system? Or did they have to carry the burden of a new system and a traditional system? So, what was nice is we had an ideal customer in this. The customer believed in the technology, and because we were able to make a good case that we were solving problems, they kind of jumped in with both feet. And so, so that, this is what was interesting. So we had the customer that jumped in, but we didn't actually know what was going to happen with the users. So, but it was in January when we figured out that the users truly believed this was so much better than Can their prior system. Story, yeah. So when we were at the, one of the training sessions, I think it was like the second training session, um, the people from HIPS were obviously at the training sessions as well, just to make sure that you know everything went smoothly. And um, there, one of the women who's in charge of collecting all this information was talking to one of the end users at, at the clinic level, who's responsible for giving her that information. And she was saying to him, like, I need your reporting. Like, you need to stay after because I need you to report for last quarter. Like, I need this information and I need to get it from you today. And he basically said to her, like, well, and this guy is a chronic late reporter, apparently. She told me later, like, every quarter she's chasing this guy down to get information. And he said to her, like, well, now that I have this phone, I don't have an excuse for reporting late. So, yeah, so it's like, they know too, and like, they think right. it's a good system. So, we were lucky in that sense that the end user was also able to pretty much immediately recognize the value of the system in terms of time saving for them. And I'm sure this guy doesn't like having Irene chasing him down all the time either. Right. So. Great. Any other questions? Or appreciate your time hearing us out. We're really excited about this stuff, and obviously we'll keep you posted as it evolves, our experiment. <laughs> Thank you so much.